wait for 30 seconds from now. So I have to bring the screen, right? Okay, it's live now. Okay. All right. A warm welcome to all our viewers around the world. Thank you for your interest in this session on building with nature to restore coastal ecosystems. I'm Anna Del Cabanban, a member of Future Earth, Ocean, Can, or Knowledge Action Network, and the country representative of Wetlands International Philippines. Wetlands International is a nonprofit, non governmental organization that promotes the conservation of wetlands, such as shallow coral reefs, seagrass beds, mud flats, mango forests, rivers, lakes for people and nature. As a non-governmental organization, we support the realization of the commitments of countries, the signatories to the Convention of the Conservation of Wetlands of International Importance, or commonly called the Ramsar Convention. In the Philippines, Wetlands International is a member of the Partners for Resilience. This partnership is composed of CARE, Cordaid, Red Cross, and Climate Center. We promote integrated risk management. Wetlands International promotes, in particular, strengthening of environmental management and restoration. Future Earth Knowledge Action Network is a global network of scientists, researchers, and innovators collaborating for the sustainable planet. It has four aims. For today, we will contribute to the first aim, which is to identify and restore and respond to society's needs for high quality scientific knowledge to successfully undertake the required transformation for sustainability. For the other ob objectives, I would like to invite you to visit the website of Future Earth after this session or at your convenience. The website is futureearth.org. Today, we have assembled presentations from three experts and from three disciplines. Professor Jurgen Primavera, biologist and academician. She is the Chief Mangrove Scientific Advisor of the Zoological Society of London. Professor Primavera will give a talk on mangrove forests, its importance, benefits, ecosystem services and functions, threats, and her efforts over the years to rehabilitate damaged mangrove forests in the Philippines. Professor Laura David, oceanographer. She is the director of a Marine Science Institute, University of the Philippines. She is a member of Future Earth Coast Knowledge Action Network. Professor David will give a talk on the impacts of climate change on mangrove forests and how we can overcome these impacts. Engineer Kazrul Abdullah, civil engineer. He is the head of Wetlands International Malaysia. He also leads the Building with Nature in Asia. Engineer Kaiserul will give a talk on the program Building with Nature, a nature-based solution that is being developed to address flooding, particularly in coastal areas that will be magnified by climate change. Please send your questions to the website provided. We will respond to these questions at the end of the three presentations. I now would like to invite Professor Primavera to give her talk. After Jen. I'll talk about Philippine mangroves. <clears throat> but first, a global perspective. Uh, mangroves are found in 14 to 16 million hectares <clears throat> in the subtropics and tropics, and they comprise uh, 50 to 60 species of which the Philippines has about 40. Here we see the Philippines with a very high biodiversity. Uh, these species are documented in this 2004 handbook, which was the basis for a poster and a field guide 
to Philippine mangroves. Many places in the Philippines are named after mangroves, which reflects the abundance and diversity of these trees in residents such as mud skippers and shellfish that are gleaned for food security by uh, coastal communities. And we also see the transients that use the mangroves as nurseries for their juvenile fish and uh, shrimp and shellfish. These two posters show the life cycle of first crop Juveniles nursed in the mangroves, and as adults, they go back to the offshore, having the same life cycle. So we see a lot of papers that show the correlation between wide mangrove area on the x-axis and high fisheries products on the y-axis. And the hypothesis is that these commercial uh, species use mangroves as nurseries for their risk connection. We also have the coastal protection function. The lower figure summarizes about 100 plus papers on mangroves. Basically, it says that the height of a wave or its energy is attenuated or absorbed or reduced by both physical factors such as topography, water depth, but especially biological factors such as vegetation, the trees, their age, size, height, and so on. So that the recommendation is if you want to reduce energy of waves up to 60%, you should have a 100 meter wide green belt of vegetation. If you want to reduce it 100% almost, then you need half a kilometer wide green belt. Earlier science, the science from the Japanese group showing energy dissipation, trying and all of us are in their papers. And the popular media reporting that mangroves acted as bio shields during storms. So mangroves provide shelter, food, medicines, and protection. And from this Vietnamese artwork, we have the goods and services. And from valuation studies, this one from Barbier et al, showing the highest value coming from coastal protection of up to $10,800 per hectare. So mangroves are very valuable. However, in the Philippines, as Brackish water ponds increased in area, mangroves declined. We can see the before and after figures. In 2010, we were at parity. At present, we have a one-to-one -one ratio. But ideally, for ecological sustainability, we should have four hectares of mangroves to one hectare of fish ponds. So, how do we attain this four to one ratio? The first recommendation is to protect remaining mangroves, especially as eco part, such as this one in central Philippines. If we look at figures showing the amount of carbon in different forests, temperate tropical rainforest, easily mangroves, contain four to five times the amount of carbon as the other forests. This is why we need to protect them. Eco parks with access to school children. The second recommendation is for degraded areas to be rehabilitated, such as seafront. Here we see a seafront in the Philippines, April 2007, the birthday of a mayor 
wanted to wed these couples for free, provided that they planted mangroves first. So here they are in their wedding whites. And here's the timeline of the mangrove, 2008, 2009. And at present, 2019, it is now a mini forest. But please note, the name of the mangrove species is Sonaratia alba, pagatpat or perepat. That survived and grew very well because most mangrove land in the Philippines, like this one in Camarines Sur in 2012, planted 1 million rhizophora propagules, really aiming for Guinness. This is rhizophora. So what happened to the rhizophora? After four years, less than 2% survival. Obviously, the wrong species. And we did research after Typhoon Haiyan in the affected provinces and found that the rhizophora plantations were devastated. They all died. In contrast, the natural mangroves survived. So we shared this with media that planted bakhau or rhizophora is not good for seafront. Wow. What's happening here? I'm almost done, actually. Please go ahead, Prof. Your view. I can see you and hear you. Yes. Okay. okay. So the doubling of the area was due to the plantings sponsored by World Bank and all these international agencies in the millions of dollars. On seagrass beds, mostly both national and international programs. So not mangrove, the mangroves, very quickly incorrect. So ZSL, my NGO, prepared a poster no to planting on seagrass beds because what's going to happen to the dugongs, the sea turtles, seahorses, and the siganips, they will lose their homes. And this was on Facebook. So if not seafront and seagrass, where then? We recommend reversion of abandoned ponds because we have high survival rates because this is where mangroves used to be in abandoned ponds. But the government is avoiding that because although equal easy, it's politically difficult to get killed in contrast to seafront and seagull rates or the ecosystem transformation. Here is our site in Central Philippines. In three years, we achieved complete cover of mangroves in an abandoned pond. Look to the left. This is the pond in three years with assisted natural regeneration. To the right is a pond just depending on pure natural regeneration, which will take up to 20 years. In the for 400 years, this natural regeneration. Now the last Two slides. We look at carbon stocks for mangroves. They are 800, they have 800 to 1,000 megagrams carbon per hectare. When you convert them to ponds, that gets reduced to about half. And the paper by Kaufman et al. from Mahakam Delta in Indonesia shows this. These are the mangroves converted to shrimp ponds. You release half the carbon from the mangroves, the low ground biomass to the atmosphere to add to the emissions and to global warming and to climate change. And if only for this, we should really, really focus on reversion of abandoned ponds. And this is the abandoned pond that was reverted 
tomorrow's site for our training courses that we have graduated about almost 2,000 trainees now. And the last slide for me is aside from training courses, we also have manuals for our information dissemination. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. And until I'm okay. Thank you, Professor Jurchen. That was a very good lecture, a talk on mangroves and uh, their importance and the rehabilitation that you are have conducted over the years. Indeed, we take note of your recommendation on, on the rehabilitation on abandoned fish ponds. I would now like to upload the PowerPoint presentation of Professor David. Professor David regretfully cannot make it today. So she has sent this, uh, this PowerPoint with her voiceover and an animation on the mangrove rehabilitation. Please give me a moment. Uh, Prof. Jen, Prof. Jen, can you please stop sharing your slides? Uh, you I, see the green I button? Just I just stopped for screen sharing. You can go. Uh, okay, thank you. Globally, climate change is associated with increasing temperature. In the marine environment, increase in sea temperature is also one of the climate factors with the most significant impact. Seen here on the left is a publication we did for coral reefs where the leaching event that happened in 1998 is highlighted. And what you see here is at the very apex of the triangle, mostly here in the Philippines, and also in the west of Indonesia and the east of Papua New Guinea, you have the highest incidence of uh, heat-related coral bleaching. Bleaching is a big deal because not only will the corals lose its color, but after a while it will actually lose its integrity. And if the zooks that live inside the coral do not come back, eventually the coral reefs will die. And since reefs are home to a lot of our fish, the loss of species is not unheard of when the coral reefs are uh, eventually gone. For the pelagic environment, Increase in temperature is, has also been known uh, to instigate a migration of the fish either away from shore, going to deeper waters, or eventually going to higher latitudes. For those that cannot migrate, reproduction is predicted to be negatively affected and recruitment failures are also likely. Changes in fish distribution and availability can lead to decrease in catch per unit effort and consequently increase in fish prices or choice of target species. Shown on the right is the projected global redistribution of maximum catch potential of over 1,000 exploited marine fish and invertebrate species. These projections compare a 10-year average between 2001 to 2010 
and the projected 2051 to 2060 using ocean conditions based on a single climate model under a, mo under a moderate to high warming scenario without analysis of potential impacts of overfishing or ocean acidification. As we see here, everything in red means there will be at least a 21 to more than 50% reduction in available food fish in these areas. Among these areas is the area around the Philippines, specifically areas in south of Philippines and east of Philippines. Temperature is not the only exposure that we need to take into consideration. For the coastal and marine environment, climate and ocean change includes changes in water budget, sea level, storms, and ocean acidification. Models project that by 2100, the Western Equatorial Pacific region shall experience significant increase in rainfall and in rainfall variability. Changes in rainfall directly affect agriculture due to access to irrigation water. In most areas, there are currently no provisions for severe prolonged drought. Flooding may also affect agricultural produce in at least two different ways, by destroying the harvestable goods and by restricting the transport of products from farm to market. Underwater, flooding can also be problematic. If the watershed is not properly managed, flooding can lead to coastal sedimentation. This can be detrimental to your coastal habitats. Corals are buried. Or at the very least, your water becomes too murky, leading to low light. This will be detrimental to your seagrasses because they need proper sunlight in order to photosynthesize. Murky waters can also increase to epiphyte densities and eventually it may also lead to seagrass regression. The increase in ocean temperature will also lead to more intense storms worldwide. In corals, those with branching forms are prone to breakage. Therefore, when a big storm passes by, this will be destroyed. Your other climate exposure problem is sea level rise. IPCC4 conservatively estimated global sea level rise at 30 to 60 centimeters with the ex western equatorial Pacific region likely experiencing higher than global estimates. If you focus on the map, you see that the highest um, exposure is shown for the Philippines with an estimated sea level rise of 9 millimeters per year or translating to 90 centimeters in 100 years. In mangroves, the main effect of sea level rise is on the establishment of the propagules, which need to be above sea surface during the daytime in order to photosynthesize. The United Nations estimates that up to 13% of all of the world's mangroves will be drowned by 2100. It is also expected that there will be change in species composition as sea level rise may favor faster growing species in new areas. In the diagram show below, for example, species such as Rogiera may disappear because those are only um, mildly tolerant to salt, whereas Abyssinia and Sonorasha will, will survive for a while but their propagules will suffer due to sea level rise. Aside from mangroves, coastal areas will also be more prone to erosion due to the rising sea level. This is because areas that were previously not exposed to waves will now have to contend with the daily energy impact of the ocean. Shown on the right, are typical coastal areas in the tropical world that have been exposed to this gradual sea level rise and the consequential increase in wave exposure. As you can see, the roots of the coconuts are already exposed. This means that the land in this area used to be at the height of where the coconut truck starts. And yet, instead, we see that the roots have been exposed 
and that means that this much amount of land has already been eroded. We have seen, however, that coral reefs that are alive and diverse with multiple life forms provide protection to coastal communities as they naturally buffer against high energy waves, even under scenario of sea level rise. Shown here on the left is the coast of Bagakai and Rizal with coral reefs offshore. And as you can see, the energy dissipation of the wa incoming waves is concentrated on these reefs. Under the scenario of no corals to the right, the energy dissipation will only happen when the waves hit the coast. Sea level rise is also predicted to affect coastal agriculture. This is because in a pristine environment, ocean intrusion into the groundwater is confined due to the high pressure of your fresh groundwater in your confined aquifer. If you pump the fresh groundwater for your agriculture, you actually decrease this pressure, allowing for increased intrusion of your ocean water. In the sea level rise scenario, the pressure of the ocean will be much higher than your pressure from your fresh groundwater and confined aquifer, allowing increase in salinity intrusion. With the confined pumping, this will lead to salinity intrusion all the way to your agricultural land. Once the so soil is already salty, it will be harder for it to be productive and th therefore compromising your coastal agriculture. The dark horse of all this ocean and climate exposure is ocean acidification. IPCC 4 predicts that ocean pH will increase by 0.3 to 0.4 units by 2100. The unknown factor is how the marine environment will act with respect to this. We do know that coral reefs are highly susceptible to reduce calcification due to ocean acidification. Ocean acidification or a decrease in ocean pH can lead to loss of coral reef structure. And this is important to fisheries because as we see on the far right, how complex your reef structure is or how many different corals there are and how the different patterns of their growth rates are actually influence the population of the adult. If, for example, an area is highly complex where there are a lot of holes or what we call refugia where the juvenile fish can hide, then you will have a high juvenile population. If you have holes of multiple sizes, then you also have areas where the adult can stay and forage. So if you have a loss of complexity or if the coral reef starts melting, then you will have less and less of this complexity and therefore less and less of the fish biodiversity and biomass. All this exposure will have detrimental effects to your coastal habitat. Increase in ocean temperature will lead to reef bleaching Increase in storm events will he lead to high sediment and high wave environments. Increase in sea level will increase to loss of agriculture and the drowning of your coastal area, including your mangroves. And increase in sea level can also lead to salinity intrusion. Loss of habitat typically result in the decline of smaller bodied fishes that are dependent on the habitat for shelter and the bigger ones dependent on the habitat as nursery. Just an example, we highlight here some of your favorite food. Tangits, which are favorite breakfast, are highly associated with your seagrasses. Lapu-lapu, on the other hand, is highly associated with your coral reefs. Maracuda, which is pelagic, is also dependent on reefs when they are juveniles. Your kitang, which is nice to paxio, 
is very sedentary and frequently occurs in mangroves. Even your pelagic pampano is dependent on your mangroves because as juveniles, they live in mangroves, estuaries, and shallow inner reefs. The first way to adapt to this changing environment is to first ensure the protection of our family and community. We can do this by making sure that all essential facilities such as hospitals, schools, evacuation areas are placed in a spot where sea level rise and storm surge cannot reach them. This means putting these essential or critical facilities at around 18 feet above sea level. Area below this can still be used as housing, as um, commercial areas, but at least we know that if there is an extreme event, or in the case of slow rising sea level, these areas will remain above water and flood free. Another way of ensuring the safety of our family and community is to make use of eco-engineering for our shoreline protection. This means we make use of the natural ability of healthy coral reefs to weaken the daily impact of waves and the ability of dense mangrove forests to dampen even the big storm surges. It should be noted, however, that the density and width of mangrove forests determines its ability to re reduce storm surge. Shown on the right is a study that shows that the different percentage in reduction in storm surge height depending on the mangrove width. For example, if you want the storm surge height to be reduced by 50%, so instead of the 6 meter waves that were felt in Yolanda, you only experienced 3 meter waves, then you have to have mangroves that are at least 3.5 kilometers width from the seashore. It also matters what type of mangroves there are. When Typhoon Haiyan hit Leyte, we saw that almost all the foliage of the mangroves were lost. But six months later, we saw that the Abyssinia already had growing foliage. And more importantly, there were already increase in seedling density around the stands. And like the other species, such as Rhizophora, where there was no indication of regrowth and very little seedling production after the typhoon. So if you want to keep our coasts less vulnerable to storms, we should do reforestation of mangroves using Abyssinia and maybe Sonerasha as reforest seedlings. In addition to protecting our coast, protection of mangroves and other habitats also have positive impact on fish biodiversity and biomass. Studies have shown that sites that have mangroves in seagrass and corals perform better at being fish refugia, just like the picture shown here above. Therefore, all three coastal habitats should be a priority. Overall, we have to recognize and accept that our marine resources are already under stress from climate anomalies. We have to provide them a better chance to recover if we take away the other stresses that we can control. So what we are pushing for is an integrated management from watershed all the way to the coast, where the watershed is protected. We restrict building near the coast so as to make our families and communities more safe. We relocate structures that are very important, such as hospitals, schools, and evacuation areas 
to heights that are at least six meters above sea level. If we have to have buildings or housing near the coast, then this has to have architecture that are resistant to disasters. And finally, we have to make sure that our coastal habitats remain healthy because they provide an eco-engineering solution to our coastal protection and at the same time provide for our food security. If we are to employ mariculture in our coastal areas, then we have to do it in such a manner as it will not affect the natural resources. It has to be supplementary to the natural resources, not a substitute for them. And finally, on a personal note, I wish the Philippines would explore more of the potential for ocean renewable energy, as this will make our country less reliant on fossil fuel and more sustainable in terms of development. Thank you for listening to me. And if you have any questions, uh, you can give them to your host and I will answer them as much as I can. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Prof. Laura. I would now like to um, upload one very short uh, video that she has also sent. It's an animation on the mangrove uh, forest and how it can, uh, res uh, how it can uh, ameliorate or reduce the impact of storms. Give me a moment, please. Uh, hold on for a moment. I'll uh, go back and reload the uh, video. Okay. Not okay. 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 I'll. Uh, I'll let's uh, proceed to the next talk, and I'll while I'll sort this issue on the, on the loading of this one simple video at the very end. We'll do that at the very end. Um, Okay, so should we let uh, his role talk? Yes, yeah, yeah. I would like to invite Prof. Kaisul, Adak Engineer Kaisul, to give his talk. Thank you very much.
is on your mic is up. Yeah, okay. Okay, I'd like to share with the audience. Oh, okay, I'd like to share with the audience a program which uh, Wetlands International is doing called Building with Nature. And it is uh, involving a number of countries in Asia. Right. In the context of why we want to do Building with Nature, uh, and as we have heard in the previous two presentations, we see that globally, our coastlines are increasingly becoming very vulnerable due to one, population increase. As population increase, people are moving into the mangrove zones. And as a result of that, uh, the mangrove zones, which helps to protect as a buffer zone, has been degraded. At the same time, we have problems with subsidence as well as uh, climate change. Right. So when, when we look at how infrastructure is being developed, it's also changing. Uh, what we are seeing is that the cost of infrastructure has increased. And as a result of this increase in the cost, uh, investments from countries have uh, slowed down. And more and more, many countries are looking to the private sector to put into place infrastructure. Um, but there's also increased risk and maintenance costs because of climate change. Um, at the same time, we do want to have more stringent, stringent environmental and social regulations so that we would have environment-friendly infrastructure development. So people have now seen that there's a need for us to transit. Uh, what we've been doing is we have been building in the coastal area. So we are in effect putting infrastructure and we are building in nature. And we want to shift that to building with nature. That, that means to align our infrastructure development uh, and to take into account the area that nature can help us. So building with nature has been done for several years now, especially in the Netherlands. You see here a slide which shows what the Netherlands have done with respect to trying to maintain a deep channel for water transportation to move. And they do this not by dredging the river as what is normally done, but they do this by constructing groins vertical to the flow. And the e effect of these groins is to cause the velocity in the river to increase and thereby it would take away the sediments and it would maintain a deep channel for navigation. Another area where building with nature has been done is to look at ponds and to try and create a situation where we can encourage the regrowth of mangroves. And we heard a lot about it in the earlier two presentations. Um, and also in the coastal area, uh, instead of building hard structures, one possibility to reduce or to minimize the impact of waves on the coastline is to come back and to uh, bring back the sediment. And we can do this more successfully if we understand how the sediment flows in the ocean. Wetlands International have had some experience in building with nature in Indonesia. And I would like to share with you some of the work which was done in Indonesia. We had a project which was uh, introduced in the Demak district. Uh, the Demak district, this is the island of Jawa and Demak is around here. So uh, what we have in this situation is that there has been a lot of coastal erosion over the past 
15 years, right? Uh, we can see the coastline in 2003. This was where the coastline was, right? Two years later, there, there has always been, been erosion. So we can see that uh, in the past, between 2003 to 2007, there was some erosion, but they were not significant. However, in 2009, and, uh, there was uh, a large storm, and the impact of that storm is it created or it eroded deep into the land. Right? And you can see that um, once this happens, uh, it is very difficult for nature to come back. It is very difficult for the mangroves to uh, rehabilitate. Um, and so in the ensuing years, after 2009, in 2012, and again in 2013, um, the erosion continued. So this area was, was in effect used for aquaculture. So as a result of the erosion, we now see that the coastline has gone in, as I showed you in the map, um, and houses which were nearer to the coastline are now underwater and are not habitable. At the same time, that road, which was a major link to the area, uh, frequently now is inundated, especially during high tides. So this area is where we did some work on building with nature, and it is next to the port of Samarang. Right, so a lot of the erosion came about due to one, groundwater extraction. We also had mangrove conversion. Areas which were mangrove was opened up and a number of fish ponds were, were constructed for aquaculture. So because the mangrove which acted as a buffer zone has been uh, has been cut down. Then what we what we find is that the there is no more buffer, and so the ocean, the seas continue to erode the coastline. So the traditional way of dealing with this problem is, of course, to build a hard engineering structure. Generally. As an engineer, we would construct a hard structure with the intention that the hard structure, and this can be a rock structure, it can be a concrete structure, uh, would be able to resist the force of the waves. However, when the waves hit the structure, there is a rollback and it tends to scour outside of the structure on the seaside. Gradually over time, as more and more of the scouring of, or the erosion takes place, then the whole structure would fail and it would collapse. Right? So traditionally, the structures are for single purpose. They are expensive. They end up disturbing the sediment and the water flow. Uh, there is also a lot of resistance. And I appreciate if we construct a a hard wall all along the coastline, then fishermen can no longer access and go out to the sea. Uh, what we do see is in nature, everything is connected, right? So if we look at the, the seas and the oceans, the waves have an impact on the land. Uh, the way the sediment is flowing in the sea uh, would have an impact on erosion. Uh, sometimes we get uh, erosion coming because the waves flow laterally. They are flowing parallel. The current is flowing parallel to the coastline and it picks up the sand and deposits it further down. So the subsoil condition is critical where the subsoil is uh, composed of very fine material it gets easily picked up by the currents. Uh, the water quality inland is also a major factor. Uh, in, in the case of uh, Denmark, uh, 
the water quality in the rivers, uh, the rivers are the main source of water. But over the years, due to development and due to pollution, the water quality has degraded very much. And as a result of this, in the villages, they turn to getting water from wells. Right? And the more we draw water from the wells, the more subsidence will take place. Uh, we saw that in, uh, in, in the second presentation. Right? So in a sense, what we do in one part of a basin will have an impact in another part of the basin. So our strategy then in Denmark was we want to bring back the mangrove green belt uh, and this will then enable the local community to have economic uh, possibilities. Um, and if the local economy prosper, then the local community will be able to spend part of this uh, wealth which is generated to go towards maintaining the mangrove green belt. So in a sense, uh, we, we want to bring back the mangrove and we hope that with the mangrove belt in place, it will generate improvement to the local community. And this will then enable the local community to spend more effort to maintaining and ensuring that the mangrove green belt remains. So within the Denmark area, um, as I said earlier, a lot of the area was actually opened up for aquaculture. Um, and what we, what we have been doing in this area is the, the, the ponds which are shown in green, um, we would want to convert it back to become a mangrove green belt or a mangrove buffer zone. Uh, the ponds which are a little bit further inland, uh, we, would, we would do part of it uh, to retain for mangrove and part of it we would still retain for aquaculture. And as we heard in the second presentation, uh, it would be desirable to have a four to one ratio, um, meaning that we would need for these areas to try and keep one four to one ratio of mangrove to aquaculture. So all in, in this area, we were looking at um, putting back or rehabilitating so that we, we get 400 hectares of sustainable aquaculture uh, together with the River Rhine mangrove restoration. Uh, what we did was in all the ponds, um, we created pathways and we, we built in, these are, these are like fences. These are made of a bamboo or it can be of bakau. And what it does is it's a permeable structure. It allows the seawater to flow through. But as the seawater flows through, it reduces the velocity of the seawater and it will then induce the sediment to uh, settle on the land side. So uh, with this, then we are beginning to see in many of the areas uh, that there is now happening a natural refilling of the sediment. Uh, and this will act to form a firm base so that the mangroves can then uh, come back. Some of the results so far uh, we find that the average stream yield has gone up 3 to 20 times and income in general has increased by 3 to 9 times. For shrimp reel, for example, before we started the project, uh, the local community was getting very poor yields of the order of about 40, 45 kilograms per hectare. And now, they are able to achieve 260 kilograms per hectare. For milkfish from, uh, from about 200, it's now increased three and a half times to 700 kil uh, kilograms per hectare. 
And when the local communities see this increase, more and more we are seeing from other parts of the area, the local community is asking us to include their, their land into this revitalization uh, on this mangrove restoration program of building with nature. So from the experience in Indonesia, the Indonesian government is now willing to share their experience with other countries in Asia. And we are developing together with the Indonesian government a program on how we can accelerate adaptation to climate change through building with nature. So this, the challenge for us in this program is how can we relook at hydraulic infrastructure so that uh, we can now change the infrastructure um, into, into where we can enhance the natural environment, not just building hard structures, but now trying to build more soft structures and building structures together with uh, trying to get nature to increase the sedimentation. So building with nature, in a sense, is a philosophy where we want to incorporate what nature is giving us into the engineering practice in an, in an inclusive way, such that we get uh, it's a win-win situation. Right. So Wetlands International is working with the Global Center on Adaptation, uh, and we wanted to convene a consortium of uh, countries in Asia uh, to come aboard so that we can establish a platform that will create an impetus for a global movement. And in July of this year, um, together with EcoShape, with Delta Race, and the Ministry of Marine Affairs and Fisheries Indonesia, we convened an expert workshop. And the output of the expert workshop was that we now have a roadmap a vision of what we want and a roadmap of how we will achieve this vision. Right, so we started off with the uh, high level workshop in July uh, and over the course of a year, we would now be looking at, there will be an adaptation summit, which will be convened in Rotterdam in October of next year. And between these two periods, we have listed out what we want to do. So we would be working at two levels. One level is at the political level, which we call at the high level, where we would work with government ministries. We would convene a country dialogue. We will convene now two regional events where we would bring policy makers and decision makers together so that they can see the work that is being done in the different countries. And to, to make sure that we would then have good pilot projects, we would have another level where we would convene the experts. And so the experts would come together and they would then be able to formulate a pilot project. And this pilot project would then be brought before the adaptation summit as an indication of the country's support of wanting to move ahead on adapting to climate change. Right. So overall, in summary, we then have uh, a building with nature where we would look at new pilot projects. We are now working at the moment with six countries in Asia, uh, but we continue to look for new new countries who wants to participate in it. Right? And with that, we hope that then we would be able to develop a program where we countries can adapt to climate change, but doing it in a way where we build with nature uh, rather than to build in nature. Right? And that's the summary of the Building with Nature program in Asia. Thank you very much, Prof. Kaizul, for uh, 
uh, Ingenieur Kaiser for the very comprehensive explanation on the Building with Nature program in Asia. I'm afraid that we only have one question for uh, our panelists. The question is, how long does it take to rebuild a mangrove forest? May I invite Prof. Jurjan to respond to this question? Prof. Jurjan, please unmute yourself. Unmute yourself first. And that's that right. That's yeah. right. Okay, the question is how long does it take to uh, regenerate the mangrove forest? Okay, if you do it just purely natural way, uh, that will be about, as I, I mentioned, 15 to 20 years. Because let's say for an abandoned fish pond, you need the water flow to come back and uh, a source of propagules. But if you have assisted natural regeneration, you can do it in as short as three years. But that is just to have a full cover. Now, we are not talking about uh, the maturity of the mangrove, you know, reproduction. So that will add more uh, years. Although we must remember that um, mangroves being uh, vegetation in really um, extreme environments, they reproduce early. Three years they can reproduce. So um, it depends on how you do the regeneration, but that is your um, range. From three years, you can have full cover, five years, but purely nature, 15 to 20 years. I think um, it's not so much how long it takes, but really it's how do we get the process to be started? You know, after the 2004 tsunami, there was a lot of uh, efforts to replant or to restore mangroves in Malaysia. In many of those cases, um, it didn't last long because there was no barrier. And so after we replanted within a matter of months, the, the sea came back with its waves and they, they could not uh, establish themselves. Um, and so the work in Indonesia is they are trying to use permeable natural structures, uh, which will then encourage the mangroves to grow back and remain established. Thank you very much for your responses. There is another question maybe both of you can respond to. Why is the sea level growing faster or rising faster near the Philippines than elsewhere? Wow, uh, the physical oceanographer should should answer that in the Philippines, no? But um, in the coastal sites that, that we work in, actually, um, I guess it's, a, I'm not a physical, this is, I think, a purely physical question. And maybe um, uh, the engineer would be better um, uh, qualified to answer that, but before I give the microphone to him, just to note that in terms of regeneration of mangroves, that's very correct. If you have abandoned ponds without the wave and wind action, that's you have your three years and your 15 years. But if you are on seafront, that is a different matter because the, the uh, conditions have completely changed for mangrove survival. So now may I ask the engineer to Talk about sea level rise uh, differences. Um, we, we always think that the sea level is the same all over the world. But in actual fact, it is not. Because the level of the sea and the levels of the tides, how high the high tides are and how low it goes, depends a lot on the topography of the land as well as the influence from the moon. Right? So, for example, in Malaysia, um, in the Straits of Malacca, because the Straits of Malacca is a narrow strait, uh, we, get, we get a tidal range, meaning the difference between the high tide and the low tide of something between 5 to 7 meters. On our east coast, which is facing the uh, South China Sea, uh, we, our, our tidal range is 
almost like a quarter of that. Right? So uh, I guess in the Philippines, uh, it is also not everywhere in the Philippines that you get the same, the same kind of thing. Uh, it's very much depending on the topography. So generally, if you have uh, a coastline where, where like you get a kind of a crescent uh, shape, uh, you, you can then expect that the influence of sea level rise is going to be more than in a place where uh, it's right facing the, to the open sea. Uh, but but we, we all yeah. think our countries are worse hit. And actually, uh, I think the people in Mauritius would, would claim, you know, <laughs> you are not the worst hit. We are, we are going to be erased from, from the world map uh, very soon. Uh, Anadel, one very quick thing to the seafront planting. The problem with seafront planting, it's not only the wind and wave action. With the erosion, your elevation, your tidal elevation has changed. And mangroves have to be emerged 70% of the time. So it's much lower. Your mangroves will drown if you do not do anything about the, the topography. It, it's no longer there. That is a precondition for mangrove growth. So yeah, just, just that. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for your response to the question. The other local factor is also subsidence due to the over extraction of water. That, that was explained in the, the slide of uh, the PowerPoint presentation of Prof. Laura. I'm afraid that we have to close. I want to thank you, our resource persons, uh, Prof. Jurjan and Engineer Kaisrul and uh, Prof. Laura in, in absentia for giving us knowledge, for sharing your knowledge and experiences in uh, mangrove uh, forest rehabilitation and coastal rehabilitation. I want to also thank our listeners from around the world. And uh, I hope that our session uh, can inspire people or have inspired people to work with other resource managers, with acad academicians, with policymakers and the private sector to uh, face the challenge of climate change and to rebuild the resilience of our coastline and the communities living behind them. Thank you very much. Mabuhay. Maraming salamat po. Okay.